And I, I, I know he has a very good presentation uh, uh, to share with you guys, so I'll, I'll give you that. And we do have time, okay? <laughs> it's just, it's, uh, you know this better than anybody. <laughs> Here, right? Can you hear me okay? So today um, we're going to talk about something that uh, um, I've kind of been seeing in the industry, and um, I think we're at an inflection point of the industry of computation and how it impacts our business. And so um, I show a slide here. I pulled out some slides from when we first started our team in 2011. And um, just, you know, we, we have the, 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 by the way, I'm Rob Otani, Short and Constetti, uh, Chief Technology Officer. Um, and um, we had a, we, we, before there was Core Studio, there was something called Advanced ACM, Advanced Computational Modeling. And this was like, we had just, myself and Jonathan Schumacher had just learned Grasshopper from, uh, uh, from the Mode Lab crew in Brooklyn, um, Ronnie Parks and Peter Lacos. And uh, Grasshopper was relatively new back then. And it, but it was like so exciting. Like we could do so many things with this, and like a million ideas came out of what we could possibly do. And one was interoperability, which is still an issue, but we knew that was a problem that could be solved using these tools. The other was um, sustainability, body carbon, and we were doing embodied carbon tools back in, back then, 2011, using Grasshopper. We could. And so the, ti the title of this presentation is called Jump on the Slope of Enlightenment because um, it will it'll become clear later. But I feel like we're at an inflection point of like, we have a mature set of tools. We kind of know the trajectory of those tools. Um, but I feel like the industry has not fully understood the, the impact of the culture of technology. Um, so anyway, that'll become clear a little later. So again, want a big a big thanks to the people that organized this event. Um, I know how hard it is. I know that their heart rate won't go down until probably tomorrow. So um, just uh, again, big shout out to 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 these folks. Um, the team. I want to give a big thanks to the team as well. So we've grown over the years, and I think um, my full time job at Short and Common Study is essentially to convince people that the impact that we make is is not just impactful, but um, sort of uh, required for the future um, success of the company. And we've been successful in doing that, um, and, but we need to sort of branch out to every single nook and cranny of the office because it's still not 100% there. Um, but that is the, I would say, the, um, the focus of this presentation. Um, we have grown over the years. So in the beginning we were doing computational modeling, high-end grasshopper stuff. We've sort of expanded that into R&D, into software development, into uh, AI and machine learning, which I'm gonna talk a lot about. Um, and I think the first thing to do of any, solving any kind of problem is to understand the problem. And, um, you know, again, my career started in 1995 in this industry. We didn't have computers. Um, we did 95% of it, our engineering, I was an engineer, structural engineer, by hand. Um, we had one, we had three computers for about 300, for about 100 people in the office. So I had to go and do my little hand calculations, run over the computer, do a couple of, of calculations with, with the computer, print stuff out, go back to the desk and mark up a drawing for the, for the CAD drafter or even the hand drafter, hand drafter itself. So, um, but think about that for a second. 90 plus percent of my time was doing purely engineering, not documentation, not opening up a computer program, not responding to emails. We used to, I used to get jump on the phone maybe two or three times a day with a, with a client. So there's so much more that we have to do today and it's such a more difficult sort of problem. So many things that are coming at us on, on an instantaneous minute by minute basis that we have to respond to. The schedules that we're having to deal with, um, are much, much shorter than they used to be. There's a talent shortage um, in the industry and a talent exodus. Um, I would say that um, 
the people that inspired me back in the early 2000s, most of them are not in the industry. They've been startups, they've grown their own companies, they've gotten out of architecture engineering, and I think that is, uh, that's a problem for us, um, for, for, for a typical consultant. The tools that we have, we know are not adequate. Um, um, they need to be customized. Um, there's so many tools out there now, people don't even know which, which one to use at the right point in the, in, in the uh, stages of the design process. And I would also say that we're, we're working with an antiquated standard of care. Um, I have a whole presentation on that, but um, that is uh, the fact that we still issue the same documentation that people did at the turn of the century of 1920 is wrong. Like something's wrong about that, right? Um, so this is a diagram that uh, I think Mustafa Rudzari showed me many years ago. And I was like, what's he talking about? You know, like I wasn't even, that wasn't even a thought process in my mind. But I would say 2004, you know, ish was about the time when computation actually became possible and became a thing. So if anybody as old as I am remembers, there was something called generative components um, and there are people doing some amazing things. Revit had just come out in the industry and I, 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 I talked about this at the Chicago um, computation uh, uh, um, group a couple years ago was I went to a, I actually organized the, or the, the presentation uh, for Sioni, the Structural Engineering Association, called Computational Design. And we had, we had Ian Keo, we had Dave Fano, we had Steve Sanderson, uh, 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 Federico Negro, um, Onur Goon, um, Neil Katz, all of these sort of pioneers of computational design. And I was like, holy shit, I'm a dinosaur, you know, with, compared to these guys. So, so that sort of like was my trajectory into, into computation. And I feel like we, where we are today is at this trough. And I'm seeing this all over the industry. Computational design teams are shrinking. Dedicated computational design, design teams are shrinking in the industry. There's a lot of people going out of the industry. Um, I see it in academics. Um, academic, you know, you know, we used to have it in New York area. We used to have uh, as, as like a constant feeder program of like Pratt Institute and Stevens Institute of Technology. And I will say, Stevens really doesn't have that program anymore. This used to be called product architecture. And then Pratt has significantly declined their computation. So everybody in this room knows it's required. It's a necessary thing to do your work uh, consistently in, in, in a professional way and fast. So we're at this trough right now. And I think we have to um, figure out a way to sort of really embed computation, good design, fast design, efficient design, into our process. So a few years ago, we had a company called the Boston Consulting Group kind of do a, it's kind of like a management consulting sort of review of our company. And they had a term called vitality. And vitality is something that's, in a way, it's sort of like corporate resilience. And the, the idea is that you have to think about what are you good at as a, as a company? What is the trend of the industry going? And how can you future-proof your company so that you can, you can remain, you can start a, an upper path of where you are? And the best example that I remember was that, that they used was um, the most profitable, profitable year that Kodak had was the year before they went bankrupt. And the reason is, is because they actually invented the digital camera, but didn't really understand that that was the future. So companies like Fuji, like bet the farm on it, they went up, Kodak went bankrupt, they bet on film. They were actually, I don't know if you guys remember, uh, producing printers that would print pictures, you know? So it was like, they, they made the wrong choice. Um, wasn't that they had, didn't have the ideas, but they just made the wrong choices. And I think companies now have to understand where they are, where they stand, what they need to do to sort of get, get to the upward trajectory. And um, again, I, I mentioned I started in 1995. And if you look at these three sort of buckets of things that we did in the industry, or we do, I should say, there's a, always there's gonna be design, there's always gonna be documentation, but simulation, I would say, we did very little of back in those days, right? It was like, architects was very rule-based, it's very like experiential. Um, engineers, like I said, we only had a few computers in the office. We weren't doing that much computation. Um, uh, and um, 
well, not nearly as much we do today. But all of those things have like exponentially increased. And so the problem has become much harder. And in those days, you had two uh, sort of like personalities in the, in the office. You had designers and technicians. Uh, we had a CAD team. We had like a 20 person CAD team and manual drafters. And I would say what has happened is the technician has disappeared. That doesn't exist anymore. The designer is doing more of the sort of documentation. And then, you know, back in let's say 2005 ish, maybe a little later, the sort of computational designers, as Randy Deutsch calls the super user, started to sort of come into play and started to sort of really um, leverage the tools to create really great documentation and things like that. So you have to think about that for a second of like, okay, what does that mean for the office? Um, so the other thing I would say is, is a problem is, I don't even know if that's a word, but robotization of designers. So again, as I mentioned, I did very things by hand. And so in order to optimize our process, we had to think very thoroughly through the process of like, how can I optimize what I'm doing to do the least amount of work in the fastest amount of time? So, but today, I would say architects and engineers are becoming, are starting out as basically robots. They're pushing a lot of buttons, not necessarily thinking about design, no, just knowing that they have to do a million things to get documentation on the, on the joint. And that's a problem. Um, that's a real problem because they're spending the majority of their time documenting and a small amount of time actually designing. Um, that's not what we need to do. Um, it's a waste of time and it's a waste someone, you know, someone with a degree from Harvard or something, GSD doing like laying out toilets and bathrooms is probably not their best, um, you know, time, uh, time spent, I should say. So engineers as well. So like I see it every day. It's like we're designing one beam. Oh, I'm gonna open up a program. You can do this design in like you know, two minutes on your, on, your, on your either, you know, a pencil or using Excel or something. They go right into the program. They're not even thinking about it. Um, so it's a problem. And, and, the, and the, the answer is, the answer probably is sitting next to their project manager, just like, what is the answer? It's like, they'll give it to them. Um, so that's another problem. So what we've basically done is sort of say, what most firms have done is basically just kept the same model and had a little team in the corner doing this cool stuff for marketing purposes or for doing certain things. And I think we need to change that process, change that organization, such that the majority of the firm is um, extremely sort of adept at doing the computation that is required to do things fast and thorough. And I think also, particularly for the larger firms, you need to customize your workflows. That is the sort of, uh, I would say the, what makes, you know, let's say SDG or makes Perkins and Will or makes Thornton Thomas Study unique is how they do their work um, uh, and what they produce. And that I think needs to be customized. So the other thing I would say, which is a risk in our industry, is that the inefficiency that has been sort of going on in the last, you know, 15 years or so is that um, there are tech companies now that are basically starting to sort of collapse into what we do. So I was talking to a tech startup recently um, who said, um, in 10 years, um, an owner will use a configurator to design like a DD level set of doc design documentation. They'll tell the architect, design that building and stamp it. We'll build it. So like, um, that is a big risk, right? It's like, what does an architect do if they don't do design? You know, they don't want to do documentation. So the other is issue is that, you know, these modular companies that are coming in and totally makes sense. They're replacing the architecture and the engineering. It's all pre-configured. I want a building with a thousand units. Go to their website, configure their building, send it to the contractor, it, that's it. You're out of the equation. We got me have to stamp it or something, but that's a real thing. Um, construction companies. I know that Suffolk has a, has a group called Illuminate and they're building configuration, design configuration tools. And they look, they, they, they see the, the risk too because um, construction, traditional construction managers actually don't construct, right? They actually manage the process. So, um, um, 
So if the assemblies or something come in or these pre-configuration design and fabrication type things come in, they're out of the equation. They actually hate uh, modular, by the way, because they get paid for time and they get paid for coordination. Module is faster, it's fully coordinated, they're out of the equation. So we have all these things collapsing in and I would say we're doing the same thing. We're creating these tools that sort of um, automate certain processes and by the way, that's, that's kind of my job, right? Is to dis disrupt ourselves. And I think that's what, kind of what I'm proposing actually. And so there's the, you know, traditional art, traditional designer in the middle getting squeezed by all different angles. So, so how to vitalize? Um, every firm should have a CTO, at least a, a larger, the larger firms. There's only, as, I, as far as I know, there's only three, right? So, we have Hilda from HKS and um, Alex Pollack from FX Collaborative. You think that, and everyone's trying to like cobble together you, the CIO's roles into a CTO. It's, it's a two completely different roles. The CIO sort of keeps the plumbing running. The CTO is the strategist. Like what is the software we need to do? What is the software we need to build? Um, you know, what are the threats in our industry when it comes to technology? And there's a lot, by the way. Um, so, you know, the whole cyber stuff is sort of like, we've had to spend tons of money on that. And so guess what? The, these firms are seeing tons of money going to technology. Well, we already spend a lot of money in technology. But um, if they're not using technology to actually improve their process or to make more profits, it's a huge mistake. Training is a big issue. Um, we need to have our firms, up, our, 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 our designers upskilled significantly. Um, and I'll get to that a little later. And I think there needs to be a computational design culture. Um, you know, I think uh, one of the, I would say, problems in our industry is that a lot of people running the firms don't understand it. And therefore they sort of are afraid to leverage it. They don't wanna be, they don't want it to go wrong. It has gone wrong in the past, um, but if they don't do it, they're gonna be out of business. So that's, that's sort of like, so we need to keep that culture of, 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 of miniature successes uh, to build a build a company, um, as I mentioned, I think you need to have customized tools. Um, I think it's been a huge benefit for us, and sometimes we're we're at the point which is actually success. People don't even know that they're custom anymore; they just use it every day. And then R and D. I think um, the people in this room are always thinking about the next best thing, um, which I think is super healthy. And if they don't have that access to thinking about those things, they're not thinking about how to sell company and the, and the industry's problems. So how to do that? I think it is to have very specific tools built for the various aspects of the project. There's not one tool that does everything. Um, and we can, by doing that, we can actually expand our services. So I've been, I've been proposing that we've been doing this is to, we do our own takeoffs. Um, why have the contractor go through our set of drawings and figure it out? I know, I know exactly what's in the building. I know exactly it's supposed to be there. So we just do it. Um, we're doing fabrication drawings now. It's like own your design. Don't let don't you know? That's like that's way what it used to be. Is like, well, the contractor figure that out. That's where all the problems start. It's like just do like do an LLD four hundred for the really important things that you're interested in. You don't what what that does is you spend more time doing design, but your shop drawings is much less, and you're going to get your design what you want. So. Um, We've been building these tools, the tool that um, uh, a colleague of ours, Margaret Wong, started six years ago or something, who, by the way, is now at Etsy.com. Um, what's that? Tw oh, she's now at Twitter. All right, Etsy, then Twitter. So there you go. So um, she learned, actually, web development uh, in Core Studio, and um, she started this tool. This tool is CD-level quality. It's better than any software out there, and it's, it looks like it's one bay, but it actually does nine different bay types, corners, interior, exterior, et cetera. And so it's a fully trusted tool. We, we benchmark against this, with a Bentley tool. We're within 1%. That's a CD tool. So huge, huge. we've been building uh, Revit tools since 2000, when we first started using it. We've got 80 plus tools. People use this stuff every day. They don't even know it's custom anymore. Um, we have a whole, Toolbox for SAP 2000 using Grasshopper, um, and um, again, there's only there's still only a subset of the of the engineers using Grasshopper, but that's growing. 
and they can do parametric design now in their favorite software. This is a tool that we've been working on for two years, Shoe All Design Tool. It's a CD level quality. It has every button in the, in the planet you can think of. And uh, we just was doing some, this is in, this is in alpha, essentially, this is almost beta, actually, it's beta. And uh, one of the engineers was telling me he did a 40 story building in under two hours from start to finish. Um, the CD level quality, which is insane. I can tell you from my experience, designing a shear wall, traditional methods, just one, that is, this does it instantaneously. Um, that's basically, but you know, after you, you put all the inputs, um, takes days. So from days to hours, it's a huge impact, a huge difference. We have tactile fabrication tools. I'm not gonna go through the video fully, but basically it does, we've been building those tools since 2014. And then Stanshade steel connections to uh, fabrication level design. Again, in under a couple of minutes, um, we sort of poured over the shears from our analysis models using our construe platform. Um, and then that's all it looks for is the shears and it, 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 it uh, instantiates all the connections, uh, all the connection plates and bolts and all those things. So again, we have a very small team, but we could do a ton of work um, with the small team. So all you can see all the connections are, are instantiated in that, that model. Um, in 2017, we developed something called Spotlight, which is an in takeoff tool. Um, again, I would, we always been asked, you know, um, in, the, in the old days, we would have the, the estimator would do the takeoff and then we'd have to check it. And I'm like, why are we checking? We just do it. Um, so this from the Revit model does a quantity takeoff, does a pricing model, as well as embodied carbon, um, sort of on the fly, super easy, push button stuff. So um, the machine learning part, um, I've been telling engineers that this is the new Excel. So when, when I started my career in 1995 and I was in grad school in 1992 or so, um, we had something called, well, even before that, it was something called Lotus Notes. And then we had something called Quattro Pro. And then we had Excel. And then when that got in the engineer's hands, they never went back. It was like, oh, I can do a thousand designs, iterations of this particular calculation. You can do that by hand, forget it. You're gonna, you're gonna, um, you're never gonna do that. So. What, what I'm excited about this is that it combines domain or it has the possibility of combining domain expertise, mine data, which is correct data, and synthetic data sets all into one model. Um, so in 2017, we developed Asterisk, which was sort of an R&D project. And it was probably too early, too soon. Um, engineers got very afraid of this. It was a little bit black box, but the fact that I can design a building um, with from just amassing in under you know a minute or so um, of a steel or concrete is insane because that would take an engineering team three three or four weeks to do. So each one of these iterations, it wasn't one hundred percent accuracy. It was probably eighty percent accuracy, maybe seventy five percent accuracy, um, which was a mistake on our part as well. I think we need to engineers want the ninety five percent accuracy, but it was you can see it was calculating all those important things. It was caught in the square footage, cost per square foot embodied energy and the weight of, this, of each element, a piece of the element. So it was quantifying the right things because the, our accuracy was not there. We still use this today on, on early design projects. So the validation of that in many ways was the fact that testfit.io was using that one of that was is using the concrete uh, column model in their platform. And I've checked this myself. These column sizes are correct. Um, so on the fly, you're getting the right column sizes. Um, the more latest things, and I'm gonna, I'll go through this quickly. This is a tim this is all machine learning. It's a timber design app. Um, there is not a person in the world that can design co a timber column of the right species, of the right size, in under a second, essentially. Um, it's pretty insane. We are getting like 95% accuracy on these on these models, and um, and you can see you'll see how we're doing this. We're doing it element by element. Sergey here is working on a, a platform that sort of is able to create a, a REST API for all these machine learning models that we could stitch together into like a recipe for a design. And then we'll be able to deploy or customize design using those element models. This is the shear wall designer. Again, something that would end each one of these iterations probably takes a couple of days for an engineer. We can do it in seconds. And it is right. 
that's the, that's that's the scary thing about this. So um, it does uniformly just uniformly reinforce walls. It does what we call boundary element designs. Um, you can change the concrete strength. You can change all the things that you can change. Reinforcement ratios, the boundary element sizes ratios. Um, you can change the thickness of the wall, or you can just do a fully optimized version. This is a con concentric breaks frames. I'm going to go through this quickly again. This is like these are things that take engineers hours and hours, potentially days, and we can do it in seconds. They're not 100% right, but they're close enough, particularly for this audience. The concrete steel column. Uh, so because the data from this that they designed that this trusted data, we actually exported that encoded uh, algorithm and the data associated with it to uh, to a structured database and created a machine learning model from that. And so this is doing vibration controlled office level, uh, you know, zero five per five percent G, which engineers would know out there, um, in like instantaneously for 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 a full full bay design. The conventional software Bentley, this would take like a few hours each one of these iterations, if you're really good. Um, I tried I tried it myself. It's so painfully slow that it drives me crazy. So um, anyway, you can see this is doing some real real engineering here. And so the culmination of that is that we can do these iterations of designs. This is a steel, concrete, and timber building. We're calculating the, all the member sizes, the weights, as well as the embodied carbon on the fly. And we can do that. It's not like we need to spend, take, you know, two, three different engineering teams to do all these three typologies. That's where I think the future is going to be. And I think, um, our industry needs to figure out, or our firms need to figure out which way they're going to go. If they hold on to the old ways of doing things, they're going to be out of business in a few years um, for many reasons. So um, this is not meant to scare anyone, but it, we're, we're, at, we're in reality now. It's like the people in this room understand that. I think it's got to get raised to a higher level. Thank you. Any uh, questions? Are we taking questions, Ron? Cool. All right. No problem. All right. Thank you, Rob.